So welcome back. I hope everyone had a quick break where they could just move about and get, I don't know, if you're in a chair like me, get your legs working again so that you're ready for the second half because we have some four great speakers on the second half. I just want to address something that's come up during the break, which is the question around diversity, um, this, which is obviously a really crucial question and something we are working on quite a lot at Autistica. So as well as event manager, I'm also leading our EDI stuff, which is all about equality, diversity, inclusion. And the idea is bringing in the Autistica Insight Group and their voices and just kind of learning from them how we've involved them and how they want to be involved and using this information to bring more people in. Obviously autism research and autism more widely is not traditionally the most representative um, sector at the moment and that is something in Autistica we're encouraging by supporting researchers who are BAME or different socio-economic backgrounds or gender and as I say by including more autistic voices in our research and in as participants in research projects. So that's something we're kind of it's one of our big strategies going forward and something you can see a lot more information hopefully in the next few weeks and months and just generally forever onwards after that so stay tuned for that part hopefully um so our next speaker is going to be monique bova who is from surrey and monique will be speaking on mental health autistic community connectedness and minority stress in the autistic population and this is a longitudinal study so Monique do you want to turn your camera on wonderful um, just... brilliant I'll just get rid of myself wonderful so I'm talking as has been said on mental health, autistic community connectedness and minority stress, particularly I'm focusing on a longitudinal study that I did as, did as part of my PhD um, alongside supervisors Dr. David Frost, Bridget Dibb and Patrice Rusconi. So a bit of background as has been discussed, there's a high rate of co-occurring mental health conditions such as anxiety and depression and trauma disorders in the autistic community alongside a high rate of suicidal ideation um, and increased early mortality. We wanted to basically test the utility of the minority stress model for understanding this. The minority stress hypothesis is quite simple. It's just that decreased social standing leads to stigmatized minority groups being exposed to more stressful life situations with simultaneously fewer resources to cope. Um, social resources can include mattering, mastery, social support, and its satisfaction and resilience. But these variables can all be very individualistic and rooted in the idea that um, you have to like pull yourself up by the bootstraps and just be more resilient. Um, so instead of focusing on that, we wanted to look at intra minority group community connectedness. So that's where the autistic community connectedness comes from because that um, is about collective resilience rather than individualistic. Most importantly, it's more of a socio-ecological approach which, which puts the focus um, particularly on how autistic people are treated in society, which can be generally um, missing in a lot of autism research. Um, this might be a little bit triggering, just a warning, because I'm going to talk about a pattern of stress exposure, um, including interpersonal violence. So um, in terms of the pattern of stress exposure that would suggest that minority stress might be um, actively happening to the autistic community. Um, for example, the majority of stereotypes about autism are negative and non-autistic people make rapid thin slice negative judgments of autistic people, um, which means that autistic people can experience a high level of rejection, for example. 
there's an increased rate of interpersonal victimization where um, as children and adults, autistic people are more likely to be teased, victimized or sexually assaulted than non-autistic people. Um, which again suggests that there are um, processes of violence. In terms of structural inequality, there is a very high rate of unemployment in the autistic community, um, even compared to other disability groups, um, and especially high compared to non-disabled groups. Um, a third of autistic people have neither access to employment or the benefit system, meaning that a lot are living in um, below the poverty line and in the homelessness population there's a high rate of autism and autistic traits. Um, similarly one in five autistic people have been stopped by police for looking suspicious. So again you can see that there are um, patterns of stress exposure that would probably be um, pretty devastating to mental health. Um, my previous study during my MSc found that minority stress um, predicted significantly worse mental health and well-being in a cross-sectional study of 111 autistic people. Things like everyday discrimination, which is like the more subtle discrimination, expectation of rejection, um, outness and having to come out and disclose, um, but also concealment, so having to hide the fact that you're autistic. Um, and internalized stigma all predicted a large amount of the variance in distress and well-being scores. Um, but this has never been done longitudinally. So um, this was one part of my PhD where we wanted to see what the effects of minority stress are over time, um, but also whether autistic community connectedness um, might have a positive relationship to mental health over time. Um, because in a cross-sectional study, we found that it buffered against the effects of minority stress, which is what we did with wave one of the data. Um, but this study in particular is talking about um, wave two. So our method, it was a two-wave longitudinal study um, done over nine months. To participate, you had to be at least 18 years old, have proficiency in English, um, and consider yourself to be autistic. Both diagnosed and self-diagnosed individuals were welcome. Um, we did this in particular because we know that it's harder for women, ethnic minorities, um, and people from lower socioeconomic backgrounds to receive a diagnosis, and we didn't want to marginalize them from the study. Um, this is just a slide to go over the measures that we used. Importantly, the measure of autistic community connectedness came from a qualitative study in my um, PhD where we turned um, kind of people's narratives into a measure and validated it. So it's validated scale. Um, and there you can see the variables for minority stress. Um, we also controlled for general stress. So that's the stress that you would experience because you're human and this is the world sort of thing rather than um, stress through marginalization. Um, in total, 99 autistic participants took part in both waves of the um, study. We had a majority of the sample, 51% were female, 20% um, were gender non-binary, and 20% were male, roughly. Um, so it was a good mix. Um, there was also a high rate of bisexuality in the autistic sample um, through all of my studies, actually. Um, in terms of our analytic strategy, just so that that's out there and everyone knows, um, we used regression because we didn't have enough for a full cross-legged panel. Um, 99 participants um, left kind of little room in terms of more uh, rigorous analysis. We used linear regression because there was high multicollinearity. Um, and particularly, we wanted to see whether um, while controlling for time one mental health score, Demographics, including sexuality, um, race and ethnicity, and diagnosis status, um, and whether time one minority stress scores and autistic community connectedness at time one would be associated with um, mental health scores at time two. So the results. 
Um, for both depression and psychological distress, you can see here that everyday discrimination, expectation of rejection, and internalized stigma were important predictors of mental health outcomes at time two. Um, interestingly, outness um, was associated with better mental health at time two. So um, the more out you were at time one, the better your mental health um, nine months later. Um, in terms of depression, minority stress variables and autistic community connectedness explained 57% um, of the variance of mental health scores nine months later. Um, and um, importantly, autistic community connectedness had a positive um, association to mental health nine months later, um, such that increased community connectedness related to lower depression scores and lower psychological distress. So what, um, similarly, in order to test the directionality of these effects, um, we also reversed um, the regression. This was done because we couldn't do a cross-lagged panel um, because the sample was too small um, and it can kind of establish tentative directionality. And the results show um, support for the hypothesized direction in that minority stress predicts mental health and not um, the other way around. Um, all effects in reverse direction are smaller and non-significant except for expectation of rejection. What we found there was that higher depression at time one is associated with significantly worse expectation of rejection at two nine months later although the standardized beta in that direction was smaller. So what does this mean? Generally, it means that increased exposure to minority stress is associated with worse mental health over time in the autistic population. The variables that um, keep coming up in my research, actually, when this is done cross-sectionally or longitudinally, are everyday discrimination, which is the more subtle form of discrimination, expectation of rejection and internalized stigma. Importantly, outness was associated with significantly better mental health um, over time. So this was contrary to when we looked at it in a cross-sectional study, which might suggest that um, outness as it's happening, as you have to disclose, is a um, significant stress it and it, it's stressful right disclosing and being worried about um, rejection is always going to be stressful um, but over time it might open up some doors in terms of long-term support um, and in terms of accessing communities um, and services right so um, outness over time is associated with better mental health Concealment at time one was not associated with worse mental health. Um, again, this is unlike in the cross-sectional studies where concealment of autism related to worse mental health. One hypothesis that we have for this is that um, concealing is a cognitive burden. So again, it's very stressful when you're doing it. Um, but also there are different types of um, concealment. So it could be that um, behavioral concealment isn't related to worse mental health over time, but another type might be. Importantly, high community connectedness was associated with better mental health in the autistic community. And why is this so important? Well, others have hypothesized that the autistic community does not exist or would be impossible. Um, and this body of work adds to previous qualitative and quantitative research, not only supporting its existence, but also showing that it might have a positive effect for people who are a part of it. Um, this whole study also tells you that context is very important. Um, while autistic people are marginalized, they're going to have um, an excess stress burden which is going to contribute to mental health 
inequalities. Um, so yeah, context is important. Some key limitations, we could not do a cross-flagged panel, which is usually done to establish some semblance of causality. The sample size suffered heavily due to attrition. So there was a 48% sample dropout um, between waves of the study. Um, we did control or double check to make sure that um, mental health scores did not predict dropout to ensure that it wasn't just people with worse mental health dropping out of the study um, and we found no differences. So hopefully it was mostly random. Um, again, we only measured one type of concealment um, and there are different types to be considered in future research. Um, in terms of future research, minority stress is an incredibly important paradigm to continue considering in the autistic community because it is in a multitude of studies now been shown to be um, a significant predictor of poor mental health. Um, more needs to be done on multiple minority status, um, including the intersection of autism and race, LGBTQ and economic disadvantage, because these are populations where the minority stress model has shown um, useful for understanding mental health. So there could be a compounding situation going on. Um, and more research is needed for, from an ecological approach. So understanding autistic people and their mental health within wider eco ecological systems. Um, and much more is needed on autistic culture, community and identity, because actually this is a group with agency um, and their, their strengths need to be appreciated and community connectedness was actually a really um, important uh, factor associated with better mental health. Um, so more needs to be done on understanding this. And then it's just a page of references. So wonderful. Thank you so much, Monique. That was absolutely brilliant. And next we have Mary Stewart from the uh, from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Um, hopefully, yes, yes, we do. Mary, right, yeah, I'm just yeah. trying to get my um, video to come on, which it doesn't seem to be doing. Um, for anyone who's not aware, at the bottom of your screen, you should be able to see a Q&A box and that's where you can ask questions that we will be putting to our presenters at the end of our session. Um, we're also replying um, through typed replies to some of them. And um, off you go, Mary. OK, thanks very much. Um... I can't see a video, but um, I think you can see my screen, so that'll be fine. And um, hopefully you can also see me. Um, okay, so today I'm gonna to be talking about autistic traits and responses on the Beck Depression Inventory. And um, we're looking specifically at the Beck Depression Inventory. And just to note that this is a project that's done with lots of different people and Cameron's Maitland's really been leading on this project, but I'll mention everybody probably, um, pro properly at the end. Um, so depression, depression is a really common disorder. It's the leading cause of disability worldwide. The lifetime prevalence of depression um, is 16.6% of people for major depressive disorder. Um, it's twice as common in women than in men. A major depressive disorder tends to be higher in lower socioeconomic groups. When we're looking at rates of depression, we really want to make sure that we know what estimates we're talking about, whether we're talking about lifetime um, prevalence or whether we're talking about point prevalence or uh, across the last six months, one year, or as I said here, lifetime. Um, and we've got to note that sometimes um, symptoms at one time point may not reflect the diagnostic category. So, for instance, a current depressive episode may be part of a bipolar illness rather than a major depressive disorder. So when we're comparing between studies, we just have to bear a few things in mind. 
Um, so this talk is um, focused on autistic traits, um, but just to put a bit more background uh, um, in, into it. So autism, as we've heard earlier on, in fact, with the same references, um, autism is associated with an increased prevalence of psychiatric disorders and symptoms. And that's from um, pooled um, prevalence rates. Um, Autistic traits um, correlate with depressive symptoms. So the higher your autistic traits, the more likely you are to have um, depressive symptoms. And just to note, I will be talking about symptoms in this way, and I will mention some symptoms of depression um, in this talk. Um, higher levels of autistic traits are associated with higher likelihood of meeting criteria for depression. Um, so not only do you have our artistic traits related to depressive symptoms, but you're also more likely to be diagnosed with a depressive disorder. And patients who've been diagnosed with depression compared to those who haven't been diagnosed to depression tend to score ha significantly higher on autistic traits as well. So this evidence altogether suggests that there may be something specific about having higher levels of autistic traits or being autistic that is related to depression. And this is really important to know because depression is treatable um, and it impacts on quality of life and well-being. So it's really important that we are able to accurately measure it and be able to um, identify it when it occurs and identify what the risk factors are. Um, so just to remind people, if, we, if people don't know what um, depression is, um, uh, this is the DSM-5 criteria, um, and um, there should be five or more of the following symptoms that have been present during the same two-week period and which represent a change from previous functioning. And there must be at least one of the top two symptoms, either depressed mood or de diminished interest or pleasure in activities. Now, I'm not going to read through the rest of the, uh, of the symptoms. However, research has suggested that particular depressive symptoms may be more pertinent in prognosis. And if we look through some of the literature on uh, in autism, then there is that kind of idea that there may be some symptoms which may be um, more readily, um, which may identify depression and autism more easily, or that they may be better um, uh, to, for, um, to identify prognosis as well. So our questions are then, does depression present differently in autistic people than in non-autistic people? And for this talk, do the current measures capture depression severity um, similarly in those who score high compared to those who score low on autistic traits? So we're just focusing on in this study on the Beck depression inventory. Um, so it's a self-report inventory. It's based on Beck's cognitive theory of depression, and it shows good reliability and validity across a whole range of studies. And um, we know that the thresholds for cutoffs, and I'll talk about the cutoffs a little bit later on, may vary depending on the type of patients. So whether they're outpatients, inpatients, community sample, whether they have um, an existing medical diagnosis as well, but that might vary a bit. But in essence, um, the Beck depression inventory has um, 21 groups of statements. Um, so like these where I've got them listed up here, where there's sadness, pessimism, pessimism past failure, um, uh, loss of feelings of loss of pleasure, guilty feelings, agitation, self-dislike, dislike, and so forth. And the participant picks one statement that best describes how they have been feeling across the last two weeks. Again, going back to this diagnostic category of two weeks. Um, so what about what do we know about measurement of depression in autistic people? And um, well, Catherine Gotham and colleagues tested a number of measures, the self-report depression questionnaire, the adult self-report uh, measure and the Beck depression inventory. And um, Sarah Cassidy and colleagues suggested that the Beck depression inventory was the best currently available self-report measure of depression. However, large sample sizes are required to test both its reliability and validity. 
So what we do in this study is look at mock and scaling, and that examines whether there's a hierarchical order of, of item responses. So whether there's a particular level of difficulty. So what do I mean by that? Well, I put in this weightlifter here, not just putting a picture of a, late, of a weightlifter, but to give you an example of, of what I mean. So for instance, if our weightlifter can lift 100 kilograms, we would assume that she can also lift 70, 80, or 90 kilograms, meaning that if a depressed person endorses the symptom item at the top of the Mockham scale, they're likely to have also endorsed all the other symptom items lower on the scale. Um, but we don't know whether a hierarchy exists for the Beck depression inventory or not. So that remains to be tested and that's what I'm gonna tell you about. So we look, looked, we've got um, a sample of 814 participants, 508 are female. Um, uh, similarly to, to the other studies mentioned earlier on, the majority are female, but we also have um, uh, people who've identified as other genders and um, we've got a, a, a fairly high proportion compared to the other studies of, of males in this sample. So the mean age is 35.6. And we asked people to complete the autism spectrum quotient and the Beck depression inventory. So we were getting that data from a, a range of studies. The group was split on the AQ score and they were split into either high or low AQ scores. And we used the cutoff score of 26. And that's when, if you know the AQ, we use the full AQ. And um, that's when it's scored 0011 rather than 1234. Um, feel free to ask me about that if you wish to know more. Um, so what about the Beck depression inventory scores? Well, as I've um, said before, we know that those who tend who score higher on, on AQ tend to have higher depression scores. And that's exactly what we see here. Now, the Beck depression inventory has a number of different um, scoring um, levels of it, so a number of different cutoffs. So there's no or few symptoms where you score zero to 13, um, a low or mild depression, 14 to 19, a moderate depression is ca um, categorized as 20 to 28, and high or severe depression is 29 to 63. And unfortunately, um, a large proportion of our high AQ scores scored in this um, severe range. So we are getting a range of scores here where people do um, endorse depressive items. Um, so what do we find? So mock and scaling is quite complicated. So I've just um, really summarized it here for you. Um, the items do not form a hierarchical scale for either the high or the low AQ groups. So each of the items um, are at the same, taken at the same level. There isn't one that's kind of more difficult than the other. Um, all the 21 Beck depression items contributed to ordering participants in their levels of depressive symptoms. In other words, one can be confident that someone who has a higher Beck depression inventory score than another person is actually more depressed. Um, but in both groups, item 21, which relates to interest in sex, had issues with scalability. Now, there's a few things that you're probably asking. You're probably saying, well, this is just high versus low AQ. What about autistic people? And I've just got some of the data in on autistic people. So I'm just going to tell you about that. Now, this is very early data. So sorry, I haven't got it as nicely presented as I've literally just got some of this in. Um, we've recruited 232 autistic adults so far. far. Again, um, the majority of them were, were female. Um, with a um, relatively high percentage of this um, sample with non-binary, other sex and gender, but we have got a, a good sample of, of males in there as well. Um, the mean age was 43, slightly higher than our other sample. And again, we have those um, high sc uh, scores for, the, for depression, um, as we suggested that we would have. Um, so again, um, exactly as with the high, um, high versus low AQ, the items did not form a hierarchical scale, but the BDI items did contribute to ordering participants in their levels of depressive symptoms. Again, the same item 21 
may not be particularly useful. And two other items um, relating to sleeping patterns and appetite, items 16 and 18, just reached acceptability. Now, some of this data was collected um, during COVID, and it could be that sleeping patterns and appetite were disrupted due to COVID, or it could be that these items are not um, particularly suitable for this, for this group. So let me just summarize the data. Um, the Beck depression inventory does seem to be a useful measure with all of its items contributing to scores of depression severity. The interest in sex item could probably be dropped. It remains to be tested whether the items relating to appetite um, and sleeping patterns are useful. Um, we really need larger studies testing the utility of the BDI as a screening in instrument. And the Beck depression inventory may be useful in studies assessing severity of depression. And that's what we're doing and relates to the, um, the talk that we had just heard earlier, where we've got studies looking at social identity on autism and social motivation in autism and looking at that in relation to the severity of depression. So it's really um, good to see that, that it is probably useful in, in those frameworks um, because it's a self-report measure and therefore increases our accessibility. So a really big thanks to all our participants and um, to Cameron, who's carried out the analysis of this data and to Kirsty and Emily and Bonnie, who've um, been involved with collecting of, of the data and um, to Anne O'Hare and Sinead Rhodes, um, who've helped, uh, who are supervisors of Cameron and to Roger Watson, who's um, helped us um, guide us through the uh, mock and analysis and to the Autism Research Centre who have helped us with the data collection as well. Um, uh, this is our uh, website where you can um, find out about some of our other studies. And um, so it just leads me to so thank you for listening and to hear our whole range of contact details and other information. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mary, that was brilliant. Um, just for reference, we are running 10 minutes exactly behind which is not down for speakers, but down to me starting break, ending break a bit late. Um, so just if you look at your time, they don't match up, that's why. So the next speaker we have is Mirabel Pelton, who is from Coventry and Ashton. And Mirabel, you're talking about a measure, you can tell your own title, it's a very long title. So I'll let you say it for yourself. Thanks, Bethan. Um... Yes, I looked back at the title of this talk and thought, gosh, I didn't choose the most engaging title for my talk. And it's called a measurement invariance analysis of the interpersonal needs questionnaire and the acquired capability for suicide scale. Um, now, what I'm doing in this study is I'm looking, um, I'm comparing the measurement properties of the questionnaires of the interpersonal theory of suicide in autistic and non-autistic people. Um, so just to give a warning, that is what I'm going to be talking about. And if um, you don't want to think about any of those topics just for the next 10-15 minutes, do unplug as Freya suggested at the beginning. Um, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit about the background to the study, why we felt it was important to measure the accuracy of these questionnaires. I'll talk about the two questionnaires um, that, that uh, form part of the interpersonal theory of suicide talk about what we hypothesized, what we found and what we think the implications are for suicide prevention in autistic people. And then I'm going to talk, hopefully, following on from some of the things we've already heard this morning and this afternoon about why social belonging is a really important protective factor and what we should be doing. And I've got a little, I'm doing a small project, well, that I hope we'll have a big conversation as part of Coventry City of Culture um, that I'll just finish by talking about. Okay, so the background to this study is really if you had been at the Autistica conference last year in Reading you would have seen my PhD supervisor Sarah Cassidy presenting a participatory priority setting exercise. I think other speakers this afternoon have, have referred to these exercises. They're really really important to set research priorities that really address the issues of importance to autistic people. Now one of those priorities in the field of suicide is looking at how well existing models of suicide apply to autistic people and this is really really important because we need models that work to be able to identify the mechanisms that are driving these um, these thoughts and experiences to really be able to guide interventions that work. And as a master's student, I was going to do something completely different for my project, but I came across the interpersonal theory of suicide. And I really 
um, was taken by the fact that it argues that as humans, we all have a fundamental set of, of psychological social needs that if these are unmet, um, can lead to intolerable psychological distress and the development of suicidal thoughts. And so the interpersonal theory argues that if you feel like you don't belong, you have an absence of genuine reciprocal caring relationships. And if you feel like a burden on other people that you, you don't have genuine self-worth, that others would be better off without you, you, then you may develop suicidal thoughts. And important to note that this is a perception that you think others feel like that about you. You may not, they may not think that, but you believe them do. And again, in our earlier study, we found, we looked at the association between autistic traits and, and and ex lifetime experience suicidal thoughts and behaviours. And we found that the association was between autistic traits and, uh, and suicidal thoughts and behaviours was through these two constructs. And that's really important to note that it isn't autistic traits or being autistic that creates these, these um, intolerable experiences. It is the social impact of those experiences. Um, however, what we found was at the same time um, that we found that similarity between groups, we found a difference and that was that the association between each of perceived burden and thwarted belonging with lifetime suicidality was significantly attenuated in the autistic group. That means it was a much weaker association. Now that could mean um, that other risk factors are more important, but before going off to look at that, it could also mean that the measurement properties of the questionnaires that we use to measure perceptions of burdensomeness and feelings of thwarted belonging may not be the same in autistic and non-autistic people. And there's another reason why we thought that was going to be the case, which I'll come on to in a minute. But first of all, just to look at the other aspect of the model, it argues um, that to act on um, suicidal thoughts, it, a, a person must, in addition to experiencing thwarted belonging and perceived burden have developed a construct called suicidal capability. And it argues that this develops in response to lifetime exposure to painful and frightening experiences. And we've already heard about this this afternoon that autistic people experience far more exposure to trauma across the life course than non-autistic people. So we tested this mediation model. Does lifetime trauma lead to suicidal capability to suicidal thoughts and behaviors? And in fact, what we found was that we didn't find a significant mediation, we found a direct effect. So lifetime trauma was associated with suicidal thoughts and behaviours, but again, the association in the autistic group was significantly attenuated. Now, this time, this couldn't be because of the trauma questionnaire, because we used um, the vulnerabilities experience quotient that somebody has already, uh, Kate, I think, already mentioned this afternoon. Um, that is designed in partnership with autistic people. So we know that this is a questionnaire valid for that population. Um, but we did decide still to measure the measurement properties of the acquired capability for suicide scale, just to check that there, there isn't a measurement difference that is skewing our results and meaning that we're missing something. The, um, okay, so the other reason why we thought that there might be a difference in measurement properties in the first questionnaire that measures feeling of burdensomeness and belonging was because the very first meeting that I had at the beginning of my PhD to discuss my proposed research with autistic people is that we had ended up spending most of the meeting discussing the problems with this questionnaire. There were three particular difficulties that we uh, managed to address before we administered it and the first one is the instruction paragraph which if you um, read that. That's a very long and rambling paragraph. Um, the second, and we actually rewrote the instructions to be a concise, um, yeah, just to be a concise phrase that we didn't think disadvantaged autistic or non-autistic people, and we confirmed that change with the scale author prior to administration. We then clarified that these days means a period of two weeks, and we then, you can't see the full questionnaire here, but we chose the shortest possible version of this questionnaire because the questions are repetitive. So we tested the 10 item interpersonal needs questionnaire uh, in a sample of uh, around 340 autistic and 340 non-autistic people. So these are the five items that measure burdensomeness and we, um, we discussed those in our group um, and we hypothesized 
that autistic people would answer these questions differently from non-autistic people. And the reason that we felt that, or, or the group felt that actually um, very strongly was that because these items um, ask you to state confidently how other people feel about you in your life, you did state confidently how other people feel. And we felt that this reflected a very non-autistic theory of mind. Okay, but you can still see in there that there wasn't consensus. So we simply reported that, that overall the group felt the, the response would be different, but there wasn't consensus on that point. Okay, then when you run these analyses, you run these as structural equation models, um, and you run the model in the autistic, in either group first, but in, in the separate groups first, and then you combine them together. And what you're looking for then is to see that you can constrain increasing parameters between the groups without your fit indices um, getting worse, if you like, without significant degradation of fit. Now, it is quite technical and uh, you can, by all means, go through the published paper, but I've just included one of the fit indices here so that you can see how you, um, how you make the assessment. So at the bottom, it says, if you have a difference of less than 0 0.01, this indicates invariance. So that is that the measurement properties are similar and that means that there is an, you can accurately compare that experience between groups. Now, when we ran the burdensomeness um, model, the first thing that became really apparent was actually the data was completely differently distributed in the autistic group. So burdensomeness should be a very rarely occurring experience. That is, if I just jump back to the previous slide, most people should be answering, it's hypothesized people would answer around one or two. Um, but we found in our sample and it was uh, created big problems with the statistics that it was fairly normally distributed in the autistic group and then as uh, we went uh, we, you know which of course flagged up a great um <laughs> you know which just shows that this measure is not functioning as it should do in autistic people um but the um and then when we went, when we constrained all the factor loadings we saw a significant degradation in fit and then item by item you can see that each one of those results does result in a degradation of greater than 0.1, which means that the measurement properties are not similar at all, and we shouldn't be using that questionnaire to compare these experiences. Now, when we came to thwarted belonging, these are the five items that measure thwarted belonging. And again, we hypothesized that they would all be answered differently by autistic people. And that was because they used very abstract and non-concrete language to describe um, a social, emotional states. Um, apart from the item these days, I feel like an outsider at social gatherings when here, this was the group felt very strongly again that this might describe an experience that's quite every day for autistic people, whereas this questionnaire is trying to um, identify, you know, suggesting it's an indicator of non normal social isolation. And this time you see that the top two items here, we meet the, uh, um, meet the 0 0.01 threshold, suggesting that these have different measurement properties, um, where actually the bottom three are almost zero, suggesting that these three items uh, have similar measurement properties, which suggests that they can be used to accurately compare these feelings between autistic and non-autistic people. And in fact, most of the um, difference is in that item, I feel like an outsider at social gatherings. And this is interesting because well, overall, these results suggest that you can't use these scales to compare these feelings between autistic and non-autistic people. But we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that there are there is research um, which does report the theme of burdensomeness. So it may be that it, you, know, you need to be aware that that is a risk factor, even if it's not captured by this questionnaire. But interesting, the underlying construct of belonging may be similar in autistic and non-autistic people. Um, but, the, you know, there could be then a difference in, in presentation as to how um, um, you know how, how that non how social isolation is is indicated or thwarted belonging is indicated in fact and that's really why we became interested in belonging as a protective factor okay but just you know before I go on to go on it's you know overall this suggests we don't yet have the validated measures for these risk markers and just I will I've included the publications on the slides but when you get to the end you'll be able to um, see my website where free copies of all the publications are um, okay so the second questionnaire was the capability for suicide scale this um, we hypothesized that 
uh, or the group did again, that autistic people would have particular difficulty with these negatively worded items. So you can see that the item, the fact I'm going to die does not affect me, is negatively worded. And to give a sort of positive response, you need to then write a negative response. And overall, the group felt that was really confusing. And in particular, this item four in the orange box was particularly um, confusing. And also, it did not talk about... Um, your own death, it talked about death in general. So we hypothesized those four items would be answered differently by interpreted differently by autistic people. Now, when you come to fit the model, as I um, said earlier, you fit the model in each individual group first. Um, now, that was very difficult to do because this model didn't fit the data very well. Um, and um, what you do if you if you experience that is go back to the published literature, go back to your hypothesis and think to your hypotheses and see why you think that might be the case. Now, when we looked at the published literature, much of it was done in undergraduate samples. Well, ours wasn't an undergraduate sample; it was a general population sample, average age forty in each group, um, age range from about seventy to seventeen to no eighteen to eighty in each group, approximately. So I tried looking at just the student um, sample. I still couldn't get the model to fit. I tried looking at men and women, because again, there has been studies looking at those. But in the end, looking at other published studies and our own hypotheses and the factor loadings of the data, we removed that very troublesome item because it had a very, very weak factor loading. And we then co-varied the error terms on the other negatively worded items. And we then found a model that fit very well the data um, and when we went through the steps of the invariance analysis, we found that it met criteria for strict invariance. We didn't see evidence, as we did in the other questionnaire, of this degradation in fit. So this suggests that this questionnaire, in its modified version, can be compared, used to compare scores between autistic and non-autistic people. So this suggests that actually non-autistic people had similar difficulties with the negatively worded items and actually doing this piece of research has actually highlighted something that needs to be addressed in this questionnaire across the board. So this could suggest this scale needs to be revised and this is in line with other suicide theorists and commentators that suggest this construct may be wider than just seven items of a reduced fear of death if we're really to understand what, um, what, what it enables people to act on suicidal thoughts but just not to um, move away from the fact that we really do need to understand more about that attenuated association between trauma and suicidality that we found in the autistic group because it seems to me this is really really important to address. Okay and then finally just to talk about what um, where our research is going from here we're very interested to understand the um, how we harness the protective power of social belonging and connectedness and I'm really pleased that this is a theme that I've heard quite a few um, of the talks refer to at least today. Uh, for my part in this, I've got a small amount of money from Coventry City of Culture to have a public debate about this. And if we were meeting um, physically as we'd originally planned to, then I would be giving you a physical postcard to fill in just to talk a little bit about what you think social belonging means to you, what you enjoy doing, what you, um, you know, just whatever is meaningful to you. Now, I can't give you a physical postcard, but you can visit my website where you can fill in a fillable PDF and you can send it to me or you can join the discussion at, at Is Belonging on Twitter. We also have, um, you can also express yourself creatively. And again, if you visit our website, you can see the various creative submissions that have been made. Um, so it just, um, as I said, this is the website where you can see all copies of my publications, read all about my research, you do, um, follow us to discuss social belonging or just to uh, follow my research and then thank you of course to everybody who's taken part in our research who um, has contributed to shaping the research and of course to my supervisors um, and to those people who've funded my research thank you thank you very much um we are now moving on to um, Samuel Bright, who's from Newcastle University. Um, and then we'll be having our last bit of Q&A for today. So here's 
Samuel. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Sam Bryce. I'm a clinical research associate at Newcastle University, uh, clinical psychologist by training. Uh, and I'm here to talk about our experiences of developing a personalised anxiety interview supplement. Uh, I'm going on a little bit to talk about what using that tool has enabled us to learn about um, the anxiety profiles or the anxiety experiences about uh, autistic adults who've taken part in our trial. Sorry, a bit of a technical error there. So, as you've heard today already, and as I'm sure many of you were already aware, anxiety is common for autistic people, uh, much more so than for neurotypical people. But importantly, it's not inevitable. It's not a, a trait of autism. So, you know, that allows us to start from the position that it is uh, preventable and it is treatable. And that's important because anxiety can lead to significant distress. It can have a significant impact on the individual's daily life lead to reduced opportunities um, it, with regards to social life, employment, education, and has also been associated with, uh, with poorer quality of life. You know, and these are, all, these are all factors that many autistic people may experience disadvantages with to start with, so it's important that we don't compound those and we seek to, to um, lessen them where possible. Um, as you heard specifically Mary talking about under a kind of depression guise, anxiety appears to have a kind of differential or a unique presentation in autism. So there's been quite a lot of research in, in more recent years that's, that's starting to try and address what, what this might relate to. Uh, and one really key factor appears to be the relationship between symptoms of mental health or anxiety symptoms and between autism characteristics, things like sensory processing, repetitive behaviours or communication preferences, all of these things feed into an individual's anxiety experience and vice versa. Uh, we've also heard Jane talk quite a lot about intolerance of uncertainty. So this being the idea that um, uncertainty is essentially a distressing or negative thing that is, that is to be avoided. Um, and this has been long identified as a, a transdiagnostic role of many anxiety conditions and other mental health conditions. Um, and it may be um, even more pertinent for, for autistic people. And also we've got evidence to suggest that autistic people are more likely to experience multiple anxiety conditions at the same time. Uh, these can compete with each other and, and sort of just add to the, add to the difficulties, add to the complexity. Uh, it can make it hard to know where to target treatment or where to start with intervention. So on this basis, we've sort of been asking the question, are, you know, are these existing diagnostic criteria for anxiety that of course have been developed uh, based on the experiences of neurotypical people, how appropriate are these for autistic people? When it comes to treating anxiety through psychological therapies or talking therapies, um, we do have evidence that these can, can be really helpful and they can help um, reduce anxiety. But I think it's probably fair to say that the efficacy of these interventions is, is more variable than it is for neurotypical adults. Um, in addition, many autistic people report dissatisfaction with mental health services, with mental health interventions. Uh, and as such, looking to improve these is a real community priority. Uh, and you can tell that. Uh, from looking at the James Lind priority setting partnership where um, improving anxiety treatment, improving mental health treatment, thinking about how these interventions can be adjusted to meet the needs of autistic people, all of these things feature predominantly. Uh, and we very much hope that the research I'm talking about now is a, is a direct response to this, these community priorities. Um, so in order for a psychological intervention or a psychological service to be acceptable to autistic people and effective, they've got to adapt and adjust to meet the individual's needs. Uh, now this is kind of enshrined in the clinical guidance that we follow, such as NICE. Um, and there's also evidence to suggest that the more, the more effective psychological interventions are the psychological interventions that do adjust to meet the needs uh, of autistic people, which is, is as you would expect, I think. Uh, we've recently submitted a paper actually that looks at some of the more basic or the more essential adjustments that are, are more about accessibility and found that these kind of class together as um, 
adjustments to the sensory environment, so making sure that the sensory environment of clinical spaces or waiting rooms isn't too aversive, adjustments to the clinician's um, autism understanding into their, their, their ability to adapt the way they, they communicate with, with people, and also the, sort of the way that the service is delivered in itself. Um, so these are all basic adjustments that we've shown to be extremely important to autistic people, but not as available as, um, as we would like them to be. So we would class these as the sort of basic adjustments that we need to get people through the door in the first place. But then when it comes to psychological therapies, uh, which depend very much on, on um, effective communication, um, I think we need to go a step beyond these here. Um, and I think this is about asking the right questions, making sure that we're aiming to address the right um, mechanisms or the right experiences of that person and not something that's kind of from the tin and that's developed for our, from diagnostic criteria. So we argue on that basis that we should be aiming to offer personalised and flexible psychological interventions for autistic people. Uh, and that's very much what we've been trying to do. So the reference here on the left refers to the personalised anxiety treatment in autism or PATA for short trial. So that's what uh, this, this whole body of work sits within this and we're, we are trying to explore the acceptability and feasibility of this intervention. So you can check that out in full um, by following that reference, that's open access. But essentially what, what PAT A is, is a, is a collection of modules. So we have a module for understanding and describing emotions, a module that, that um, for mindfulness skills. We also have a module that's designed to help with situational anxiety or phobias. So that's within a virtual reality environment and it's been tested in, and published um, and found to be to be really quite positive for autistic children and adults. Um, a module for coping with uncertainty in everyday situations, which is as Jane was talking about, but of course this is a, an adult version of that. And also uh, an adapted CBT for social anxiety. And all of these modules are uh, designed specifically for autistic people in mind. They're not things that we've kind of just taken from, from existing um, existing treatments, they're all designed specifically for autistic people. So someone would get one or a combination of modules to meet their needs. So when it came to, when it came to thinking about delivering a psychological intervention, a personalised intervention, it was very clear that it's impossible to do that unless you start at the very beginning at the assessment stage. If you don't uh, get a, a personalised, a detailed understanding of what an individual's anxiety experiences are, then you can't begin to treat them in a, in a personalized way. Uh, and we found there really wasn't anything available for this. So, so firstly, and it's still under the guise of this grant, we've developed and validated in a, in a large sample of autistic adults, the anxiety scale for autism adult, or ASA A for short. This is a self-report questionnaire that aims to pick up on some of these mechanisms that I described before again, de developed specifically for autistic adults in mind. Uh, and that is freely available if you follow the link there or I'll, um, I'll try and post the link in the chat section as well afterwards. Um, but we also aim to go beyond this for the purposes of the trial to develop a, a kind of interview supplement that can be used alongside any clinical interview for anxiety, um, whether that's uh, a standardized one like the ADIS, which we used or just a kind of routine clinical assessment that you would, you would find in mental health services that's sensitive to identify the kind of key and important triggers and mechanisms of anxiety for, for an individual. Uh, importantly, that's acceptable and feasible to use with autistic people and within existing mental health services and has the ability to inform personalized treatment plans. So what we've come up with is the PAYS A, which I'll just refer to as the PAYS, which is designed to be administered by a clinician who should have um, some experiences of autism or some understanding about autism as standard for use with autistic adults. Uh, and before you can use the PAYS A, you, you have to determine um, what a person's anxiety related situations are and try and get some sense of the severity of the anxiety in that situation. So this is the kind of bit that you would do from the existing um, diagnostic interview. 
And then the pays can be used then to look at the specific mechanisms behind that person's anxiety in the situation. And at the next slide, I'll, I'll kind of go into this with an example. So, so bear with me here. Um, but when it comes to listening for the clue, for listening for what those mechanisms are, first off, my experiences were if you if you just listen to the person describing their anxiety in that situation, and a few of them, those mechanisms often kind of reveal themselves through their descriptions. But the pays also has uh, includes some guidance for follow up questions that, that aim to look at look at the presence or not of some of these specific mechanisms. So what you can see here is not the full pays because it wouldn't fit nicely onto a slide. So it's the it's the sort of sections that I guess we use use most often. And down the left hand column here, you've got um, some mechanisms for anxiety that have been identified in past research or through clinical experience. Then across the, the right hand column there where you see situation or symptom number, you kind of um, work through that for some of the specific anxiety situations that you've already identified. So I'm just going to take you through an example here. Um, and just, just to mention that these, these are not necessarily from one of our participants and they're certainly not all from one of our participants, but they're kind of, they capture some of the themes that we come, came across uh, quite often in this study. So the first situation, X is anxious about going to the supermarket, particularly during busy times. And as such, they mostly shop online or occasionally they'll go to the supermarket after midnight when it's quiet. So you can see here now, first off, I've, I've presented them together here, but first off, you would kind of go through and identify which mechanisms were important to this particular situation. That's the kind of tick part. And then you would try and go through and allocate a kind of percentage contribution for each of those. Uh, and that can be done just through talking. It can be done, uh, sometimes we use pie charts or visual ways of doing that, depending on what the person's communication preferences are. Uh, also, some people kind of struggle to identify an actual percentage. So we just sort of, we were quite happy to say, well, it's, it's mostly that and a bit this, or it's all of that. So you're just trying to get a sense of what mechanisms are, are relevant and very approximately, which are the most important ones in that. Second situation here, X experiences panic attacks around four times a month with a range of very unpleasant symptoms, including heart palpitations, dizziness, and a fear of losing control. So you can see here, um, again, that in, these were, were mainly related to kind of uncertainty and difficulties coping with uncertainty. Also related in part to, to sensory processing. Um, and about 20% of the time for this person, those panic attacks seem to come out of the blue or without a clear trigger. And finally, X worries excessively about their finances. These worries are with them at least half of every day. They check their bank balance more than 10 times a day and they cannot enjoy any activities that cost money as they worry they won't have enough. This is putting a strain on X's relationship with their partner. And in this case, the uncertainty was explained in entirely this. So actually in this example, um, a person uh, said to me that they would rather know that they have no money than not know, but they might have lots of money. So that was a clear kind of indication that uncertainty was a real factor behind this anxiety. So you bear with me, I know it's, it's a slightly busy table here. Uh, and again, this doesn't capture all of the anxiety conditions that, that came up as part of this trial, but it does cover the, the main ones that we encountered. So, so what we're looking at here is the anxiety diagnoses of our sample, which was 34 people aged between 18 and 62, uh, with a mean age of just over 36, 65% uh, of whom were male and 35% female. So you can see at the top, uh, anxiety in social situations was, was a real, real difficulty for, for the vast majority, 97% of our sample. Um, and we break this down here by those who fell kind of neatly within the DSM social anxiety disorder category and those who didn't. Uh, and for, for, for an anxiety, a social anxiety to meet criteria for social anxiety disorder, that anxiety has to be driven predominantly by fear of negative evaluation, uh, i.e. being judged by other people, judged on your appearance or judged on your social performance. So in, in our case here, 88% of the people fell within that category. 
and 12% of people we had to use the other specified anxiety disorder because fear of negative evaluation wasn't a, a theme or wasn't a significant theme in that. Um, and this 88% we, we sort of gave the benefit of the doubt to the, the criteria if we could. So in the last example, I think 40% of my example was related to fear of negative evaluation, 40% related to uncertainty, and 20% about sensory difficulties. In that case, we would, we would give a, a diagnosis of social anxiety disorder because fear of negative evaluation explained as much of that anxiety as anything else did. Uh, likewise, 79% of our sample experienced clinically significant generalized anxiety disorder. Worries about finances or worried about PIP assessments were really common in this. Um, and phobias, sorry, I'm aware of the time. Let's skip, uh, skip through a little bit here. Phobias, again, were really common, but what was really interesting about the phobias were that they weren't very often a, uh, our participants' priority for treatment. I think perhaps because it was slightly easier to avoid phobias, you know, quite common ones like spiders or um, heights and things like that. They were easier to avoid than social situations or worries or things like that. Um, again, panic's really interesting because this one we identified that uh, people's experience didn't map onto the classic panic disorder as much as they mapped onto another one. So again, for panic, you would, you would have to have these panic attacks that were triggered kind of out of the blue or without a clear trigger. But often, you know, I had conversations with people about, um, about the, their panic being, you know, this more of a meltdown or a shutdown or people's kind of talking about their anxiety being at a stress level and then if something happened to tip that over, that's when they would have a panic attack. Um, and likewise, obsessive compulsive disorder here and separation. I'm, I'm not going to go into those ones as much. So I'm just going to move on to some of the lessons we've learned from, from using this tool. So it's something that takes time and thought from both the clinician and the person. I think the, there was a variance between the, taking about two hours to up to five or six hours. Um, to do this, of course, broken into as many sessions as that person felt comfortable with. Uh, and some of our early, and it is anecdotal at this stage because we've not begun to analyse this data, uh, but it suggests that the PAYS is acceptable to autistic people. So a lot of people have told me that actually it became part of their treatment because they felt kind of listened to and understood more so than they had done in previous experiences. Um, and no one reported that it took too long or too much of their time. Um, a second researcher rated a section of, the, of our tapes and found that this tool has really good interrated reliability. Uh, it appears to be sensitive to identifying the key mechanisms uh, for anxiety in autistic adults. Um, and it showed that it was able to identify recurring themes that could span across multiple anxiety conditions. So 75% of our sample had at least three current anxiety conditions. And I've just repeated this slide here so you can see that Actually, situation one relates broadly to social anxiety, two relates to panic, and three relates to generalized anxiety. If you look across the top here, you can kind of see a recurring theme of intolerance of uncertainty being um, a factor in all of these things, and that provides a kind of prudent starting point for treatment. Um, and this, this tool has enabled us to develop a personalized treatment plan for people, and we've we developed an algorithm for, for doing that, but I think that's a, a talk for another day. So finally, just onto the kind of next steps. Um, we found, as expected, that many autistic people's anxiety experiences do not map neatly onto kind of existing criteria. And this suggests that some of the treatments that are based on these might not be appropriate. So if you try and treat someone's social anxiety for based, based on, on fear of judgment, but it's actually about uncertainty or it's about sensory processing, and that's not going to, it's got less chance of being effective. Um, this, this tool ensures the clinician can identify specific anxiety subtypes and the key mechanisms here. Uh, and just for the next steps, we, we will be concluding this uh, feasibility and acceptability trial this winter. And then we'll go on to seek funding for a fully powered multi site trial to look at the effectiveness. So I guess at this point, we'll be able to see whether this personalized assessment tool and the, and the personalized uh, treatment that comes after it is more effective than what's out there at the moment. And we, we certainly hope that it will be.
Um, and of course, we'll work with autistic people and with service providers to kind of explore and address any barriers there might be. I'm conscious that, that time um, is, is sometimes an issue in mental health services. But we would argue that, that, that time spent on a proper assessment is time saved in the long term. because It will allow you to kind of address what's actually behind that person's anxiety. Uh, and just finally, um, many thanks to all the participants who've taken part in this, uh, to Autistica for funding this study and our sponsor, Cumbria, Northumberland, Tyne and Weir, NHS Foundation Trust, uh, and all of our Pat Aco investigators, a team led by Professors Jeremy Parr and Jeffrey Rogers, and our therapists there as well. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, Thanks guys. So we've come to the end of our last talk for the session. So we're running slightly over. So this is now going to go on to 5.30. So just be aware, obviously, if you need to go before 5.30, you can go. Um, that's totally fine. Sammy, are you able to turn your screen sharing yeah. off? Brilliant. Right, so we'll move on to the next Q&A section. So we've got Samuel, Mary, Monique, and Mirabel, you'll be joined on your own. That's brilliant. So we've got some good questions coming from the audience. Um, I'll start with a question I asked the first half of the speakers first, which is kind of what led you to your own research? What led you to studying what you are studying? Um, Monique, I'll go to you first. Um, so I did an undergraduate in social care practice and um, at the time I was also diagnosed with autism and I found a lot of the literature to be um, a little bit stigmatizing and I, I, I don't know I couldn't recognize myself in it at all. Um, then I started my master's, a conversion master's into psychology um, and I want to do study mental health in the autistic community. And I met my primary supervisor, Dr. David Frost, who's done extensive research into minority stress and hearing him talk about the concept of minority stress, um, something just really rang true. Um, and it really mapped on to the experiences that um, I had and also that I saw in literature because it's already quite well established that autistic people are like more likely to be victimized and abused and experience marginalization. Um, but nothing had really brought this together into uh, more of a theoretical framework. Um, so I decided to focus on that in my master's research and my PhD. Um, but also I found that looking at sort of some of the positives is also really important. There's this big vibrant autistic community and there's lots around identity and culture that just seems to be missing from research. So I really wanted to not only get into as much depth as possible on what um, community and belongingness meant to autistic people, but to really examine how that might kind of buffer against the negative experiences that autistic people have. Um, yeah thank you um mary i'll come to you next yeah hi um yeah so i did a undergrad in psychology um, master's in neuroscience and phd in the department of medicine and psychiatry and um and i i was researching so i've researched it into eating disorders during my undergrad degree when i worked in institute of psychiatry and then into um, schizophrenia for a master's um, for a master's project and then looking at risk factors of depression for my PhD and I got so I was very interested in how all of these kind of intersected and what was a commonality among them among different disorders and I worked um, then down in Newcastle which seems to be a theme here today as well um, uh, um, and had the uh, opportunity of working uh, with autistic people there, there and became really interested in the different ways that um, autistic people may interact with the environment and perceive 
um, sound and, and perceive speech and how depression, and we wrote a paper, a review paper on depression um, and autism then, and just became really interested in that. So we've, we've now got a whole body of work looking at factors relating to mental health, such as metacognition, which Kim's talking about on Wednesday, and about social identity, about social motivation, um, and attribution, a whole range of studies looking at um, mental health and, and autism and, and the intersecting of con conditions is, is what I'm interested in, how people access um, healthcare and stuff like that. So that's, that's where we are. Brilliant, thank you. Um, Samuel? Uh, yeah, well, I'm a, as I mentioned, I'm a psych clinical psychologist by background. So I guess before I, before I started getting interested in research, I was interested in, in clinical work and I spent most of my career doing clinical work um, over research. So I've worked with autistic people across the lifespan, uh, people with intellectual disabilities and people without. And I guess just seeing kind of firsthand how difficult things can be and, and actually how the, the ways that our services um, and systems are configured are not often very helpful for people kind of led to a, what I think is quite a natural um, desire to try and do things a little bit differently to help. Um, you, know, you know, I remember one of my placements working in, a, in an IAPT service and speaking to, to autistic people who had really significant anxiety, but just couldn't access the service because the, the telephone triage was was too distressing for them but actually that was a kind of prerequisite for accessing the service I just thought this is crazy um, so I guess um, I guess those kind of things are what got me interested in in working with autistic people and I kind of I've known for a long time that I wanted to work with autistic people either clinically or research or both but then during my doctorate I was working at Jackie Rogers and Jeremy Powell some of my supervisors and seeing their kind of enthusiasm and seeing their kind of desire to address some of these these kind of big problems that you actually feel as a clinician on the kind of ground in the NHS you feel and you experience and you come up against these barriers the chance to try and kind of address those in a bigger way was really appealing so I guess that's what got me here. Thank you Samuel and Mirabel if any of the last question same question to you rather. Yeah thank you um, so I haven't um, had a career in psychology. My first undergraduate degree is in European studies with Hungarian and I then worked in international development for 10 years and then I uh, owned and ran my own restaurant for around 10 years and then I um, um, I had to uh, close my restaurant uh, following the adoption of my three children and it was really when I was going through the adoption preparation and training that I first really had any exposure to psychological constructs. We, um, when you apply to adopt you must do a lot of attachment training on attachment theory and obviously on the effects of trauma on child development um, and one of the things we learn really is that adopted children all have a very complex mixture of probably undiagnosed neurodevelopmental difficulties possibly diagnosed medical difficulties they've experienced enormous social stress um, and of course uh, the most unimaginable traumas including permanent separation from the biological families um, and you must you're really challenged in your adoption preparation to think about the experiences the children have had and how you're going to react how you're going to um, support them now I, I then obviously found myself a full-time carer um, and, and just the opportunity came up then to work at the University of Birmingham on a part-time basis looking at the overlap between autism and psychosis and I was doing that when I applied for masters at Coventry University and there I met um, the inspirational Sarah Cassidy and she um, supervised my masters and I think I just um, hinted at it in my uh, presentation but I had been planning to pursue my um, work looking at the um, overlap of autism and psychosis what we're really looking at is the influence of autistic characteristics on the presentation and um, outcomes in psychosis um, uh, but I didn't you know when we came across the interpersonal theory of suicide it struck, just struck me that this resonated with so much um, um, that was relevant to autism and obviously fit with Sarah's um, research interests so 
uh, I did that piece of work for my master's and then I've had the fortune to continue in my PhD with Sarah, also supervised by Jackie Rogers, um, Kimball, Ashley Robertson and Hayley Crawford. Um, Thank taking you. some questions from the um, chat. Um, it's kind of touching on what you've already said, Sam, but um, several people have asked about um, kind of getting services such as IAPT to do things differently and um, more specifically um, including things like trauma-informed treatment, but also uh, someone asking specifically, how do you think the PAT-A and ASA-A would be accepted by IAP services as it's very hard to get them to do anything differently. Yeah, uh, you know, I absolutely, I absolutely accept that. What I would say is though that, that we engaged with IAP services during the recruitment of this trial. So I went out and I presented about these things to them and there was a lot of enthusiasm about it by, you know, actual clinicians who were doing this work, a lot of interest in it and a lot of acknowledgement that they know they're not really getting things right at the moment and there's too much kind of political hot potatoing and, and people just not getting the support they need. I think that's the first thing to say is I think actually a lot of the clinicians accept that and appreciate that. I agree that there are challenges in getting these things out there and getting them to be used by the masses. And I think the first step for us to do that is that we need to kind of look at this, look at the efficacy of these treatments and provide a compelling argument that they are effective and then um, yeah engage with service providers like I said and try and kind of work through these barriers uh, I think you know there's, there's there's an acknowledgement that if you don't address someone's mental health conditions they don't just go away quite the opposite so I think it's about making the argument that you know what we need to be doing here is kind of front loading this time and making sure that people are given enough time to start with, to avoid people keep coming back and to avoid people's, um, you know, to improve people's lives. I guess that, that's what that's what I should be about. That's what any health service should be about. So it's just about trying to kind of firstly demonstrate that, that that's what this can do and then sell that in a compelling way, I guess. And I think one of the things that we're keen to do, you know, especially because this is, this is charity funded, is with all of these things, you know, down the line, we'll be looking to make freely available, you know, we'll publish treatment manuals. The treatment manuals themselves, we, we wouldn't expect that to take significantly more time than what's out there. We just expect them to kind of address things in a more comprehensive or a more personal way. So our argument, yeah, I guess in summary, our argument would be that um, time spent is time saved in the long run and distress saved. And who wouldn't want that? And then kind of this is be relevant to all of you. But, uh, someone asked about um, kind of the concept of measuring um, using kind of validated tools, um, mental health in autistic people. And um, how do you do this in those that are less verbal? Um, and do you think this is due to real differences in prevalence or diagnostic biases or like failure of the tools? Don't know who wants to go with that. Um, I, I can start kick off and then see, see who wants to um, come in. Um, no, I, I, there, there are measures for um, people who are less verbal and what has been happening what tends to happen is um, that even though things like depression and anxiety and many of these mental health things are about how you feel yourself, um, it these measures can be completed by somebody else on that person's behalf. So instead of how do you feel, how are you currently feeling, um, do you feel that this has changed Then somebody else might, um, a carer or a parent or somebody who knows the individual well, may fill that in on that individual's behalf. Now that can be problematic in itself because then that's about how this other person understands that individual rather than that's individual's own feeling because 
um, depression is how you feel, not how somebody else feels that you're feeling. Um, and so there's been a push to try and um, uh, construct um, more objective measures of, of depression um, so that somebody doesn't have to fill those in themselves. Um, and there's a whole range of measures that are being developed and have been developed. So we can use things like our mobile phones and um, to look at how much we move. And um, so we could maybe have like have a smartwatch or something on to see how much we're moving. And um, because something like psychomotor retardation is um, a really good indicator of, of depression and um, that we can use cognitive measures and we've used cognitive measures for many years and we can use those in learning disability. And um, so we've got did a paper quite a while ago um, looking at executive function. We know executive function changes. So there's a whole range of other measures that we can use. And um, the thing is, is with these self-report measures, um, they're very quick, they're very cheap um, to do other measures. Um, we're still developing ones that are as reliable and valid with the same specificity and, and selectivity as some of these self-report measures. Somebody else might want to pop in there. I think as well as that, um, just to add to that, we need to make sure that we don't conflate um, people who are minimally verbal as all having um, co-occurring intellectual um, or learning disabilities because there are a lot of autistic people who um, struggle to communicate um, verbally, but also can read um, and fill them in. So one of the, the issues I find is that people um, jump straight to the assumption that if someone has filled in a survey online that they are not minimally verbal and that's not always the case. So we just need to get that in there and make sure that actually when we, also when we do this research, rather than assuming um, that that is the case that we actually ask our participants um, because I find that a lot of research in autism just never does. There's just the assumption um, based on the diagnosis that you are um, given. So there's a bit of kind of a problem around that. Um, but yes, there's, there's a great need to develop measures actually that um, do take into consideration or um, really evaluate also the, the subjective experiences of people with um, learning disabilities, because there's um, a lot of experiences that I think are put on to people with learning disabilities and they don't always um, correlate. Um, so trying to find ways, and obviously it's very, very complex, but trying to find ways that actually we can get a good understanding of the experiences that people are having without um, assuming because as we know from research that's coming out now um, especially people with learning disabilities we assume that they have a less rich internal experience um, and we need to make sure that actually that experience is captured. Thank you Monique. Mirabel do you have anything kind of in your experience to add about less verbal people? Uh, not that hasn't been mentioned already. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Samuel, what about you? Uh, no, I think um, I think Mary and Monique covered that uh, very well. Brilliant. Well, I think that's a good place to end our session for today. So thank you hugely to all our speakers and my co-chair Freya. Just as a reminder for those who are you know, tuning in throughout the week as keynote speakers on Friday, we have Sarah Casti and Jackie Rogers, who both kind of focus around mental health site topics. So we'll go in a bit more detail there as well. Um, and obviously this will be recorded, so you'll be able to watch back after the event. Right, thank you very much. Thank Bye. You.